person said to me, Pastor, I only come to the church work day to get a donut. I said, well, praise God, I'll buy you a donut every Sunday if you can. <laughs> praise God. Well, this morning is Palm Sunday, and that means so much. So I want today to tell the story, if I can. Can we walk through the account? Can we kind of take a break from our regular series that we're doing in 2 Peter the next couple weeks here? And please be here Good Friday. I just want to encourage you. We're going to receive communion. We're going to thank Jesus for dying for us on the cross. It's going to be a wonderful time of worship and, and, and intercession and, and thanksgiving to the Lord. But today is Palm Sunday, and it, it's quite an intriguing time. And I kind of want to go through the account of history here and talk to us about what happened um, that we celebrate this day for. So the story, of, really, of Palm Sunday is one of lies, deceit, betrayal, and grace. If we're supposed to glean anything from the emphasis of this day... In the scheme of things, really, it is grace. First, I'd like for us to get into the story this morning, and that means telling the, getting the setting of what's going on relationally with Jesus and the people, historically, how the story is set, and politically, how it's, the story is viewed. Secondly, we want to look at the implications of what it means for the triumphal entry into the city. And lastly, we want to embrace the significance of Jesus coming like he did. Just the day before Jesus comes into the city, riding like he did in this kind of victorious way, the chief priests had already made plans to kill him and Lazarus as well. It says uh, back in John chapter 12, verses 9 to 11, it says, Meanwhile, a crowd of Jews followed, uh, found out Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. I suppose they probably would. I mean, seeing a man raised from the dead is powerful implications. So here's Lazarus with Jesus, and they're coming into the city, and, and the, so there's this news right here in Scripture, that John's account, um, that tells us that there was already a plot to kill Jesus. So they, they plot to kill him even before he comes into the city, and it's pretty amazing to see how the strategy and voice of these really satanically inspired leaders can turn the crowd so easily. But they're, they're only a part, really, of the fulfillment of all that was happening to Jesus, the reason that he died for us. As all this plotting is going on and all this scheming behind the scenes, and just before Jesus makes his way into the city, he has this famous conversation with this vertically challenged man named Zacchaeus. He was short, shorter than me, shorter than Joe. He was short, he was shorter than Tammy. I don't really know that for sure, but Tammy, that, is that pretty short, Tammy? Yes, that, she agrees, that's pretty sure. So he, he, he's Zacchaeus, of course, a tax collector, and, and also right before he goes into the city, he, he tells a story as well. He call, talks about the rich man that went and left three guys some money. One he left, you know, uh, uh, ten and five talents, and one he left one, and then um, the, the boss comes back, and the one that had ten... Uh, the guy said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you in charge of a lot. And the second one, he doubled his money as well. I'm going to put you in charge of this much, and, and you've done a good job. Double your wage. And, and the third guy comes back and says, you know, I was afraid. So I took the talent you gave me, the money you gave me, and I buried it in the ground. So here it is. I've cleaned it off. It's nice and shiny. I'm going to give it back to you. And what does he say in the store in the account? He says, the, 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 the master says, you wicked servant, you should have at least put it on account with the banker so that I could have at least received some interest from what I gave you. Then Jesus um, really does this amazing thing because he says in the account, he says, take from him that only has one and give to the one that has ten. And everybody's like, why? Why would you do that? Because this is, this is a, doesn't seem fair that you would take the one from the one that has none. And then Jesus says, you've got to risk your life to get more than you ever dreamed of. If you play it safe, you're going to end up holding the bag. He puts it to him in uncertain terms, and he leads by example. He says, you've got to know the risks, and you've got to move forward anyway with what God has given you. So Jesus starts walking with his disciples toward the city. All this is happening, the visit with Zacchaeus, the story of the account that he gives, and he's walking toward the city in a crowd, 
So they get to Bethany uh, uh, at the foot of the Mount of Olives, and he stops and sends two of his disciples ahead to get a donkey for him to ride on into the city. We find this account in a few of the Gospels, in Luke, John, and Matthew. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 37, it says, When he came near the place where the road goes to the Mount of Olives, a whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Then in John chapter 12 and verse 12, it says, The next day a great crowd had come from the feast and had gathered, was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to him to, out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Then in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 21 and verse 9, it says, The crowds went ahead, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They're shouting this word, Hosanna. This Hosanna word is of Hebrew origin. It means, oh, save. So in essence, they're saying, oh, save us. And they were looking for a savior. They were definitely, in their mind, Jesus was coming back to establish an earthly kingdom. The zealots said, just what had just happened is a marvelous thing. You can read about it in the Maccabees. If you have a Bible that has at least first and second Maccabees, um, some of them do, Catholic Bibles do, but Maccabees is an incredible story about a righteous name, named Matthias that had these sons, and he went up and he led a revolt against um, the, the established Roman rule at the time, and, and they, they ordered him to come up and sacrifice this pig, right? Well, the Roman, that was sacrilegious, so what he did, he lifted the knife and he slew the soldiers. And so now all of the, you know, everybody's after him, so they go and they hide in this place, you know, the account of Masada and all that stuff goes on from there. But what happened was that because of all of this had happened, there stirred up this, this crew of people called the Zealots. Simon the Zealot was one of them, part of Jesus' disciples. And they thought that the, Jesus was coming back to establish a kingdom by force. So there was this mentality that was riddled throughout Israel, or through the Jews at least anyway, that, that they were gonna, someone was going to come and was going to save them from the Roman rule of the day. And that was, of course, somebody who was going to be compiling a lot of political uh, clout, somebody who was going to be getting a great reputation, maybe somebody who healed the sick and raised the dead. Maybe this guy Jesus is the one that we should be following. He's going to have the political clout. He's going to have the following in order to overthrow and rule the people as we ought to and get this Roman rebel out of here. There's a lot of people that were looking for a savior that way. Some people still look to Jesus to be a savior that way today. Entertainment offers saviors. People are looking for saviors all over the world. We can sit in front of our television and let the power of Netflix wash over us and Science fiction offers imaginary answers to the purposes of life and wishful thinking to aspire toward. Science fiction and video games together really offer an escape from reality and excite the mind, uh, entertaining the imaginations. Novels and books can do the same thing. In music, Savior is a big title for Bob Dylan, Lisa Marie Presley, 30 Seconds to Mars, Billy Bob Thornton, and Red Hot Chili Peppers. Christian rock opera group called Savior Machine, and a brutal death metal band called Severed Savior. Every sports team has saviors from their leading running backs and quarterbacks to seven-foot centers in the middle of the basketball court that are all heroes to the team, to the pitcher they can throw in the mid-90s, which Mariners apparently have none. A quarterback that can move their team down the field but, and put points on the board. Various news stories have been declared how that Howard Stern is the savior of satellite radio. Kanye West, the savior of the music business, that would be extremely unfortunate. There's always been in the mind this human condition for saviors. In Greek culture, philosophers like Epicurus and gods like Zeus and rulers like Ptolemy were, were heralded as saviors. And the Romans, the emperors from Nero's line were also considered saviors. But only Jesus saves who does Jesus save? We find the word Savior in Scripture 24 times in the New Testament, with eight of them referring to God in general and 16 referring to Jesus specifically. In Titus 2.13, it calls him our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a proclamation. Jesus is the global Savior, first of all, of every nation, tribe, and language. Jesus, the Bible says, is Savior of the Jews. It says he's savior of the church. He's savior of the world. He's savior of the lost. 
He's Savior of sinners like us. What does He save us from? He saves us from a lot of things. There's too many to list, but I'll list four general categories. He saves us from sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He saves us from death. That no longer do we have to fear death. That, that we can go home to be with Jesus. Our, our, our dear sister Julie went home to be with Jesus. We're going to have a memorial for her soon. And, and we're going to celebrate the fact that she's with Jesus today. We're going to see our Emily one day. Amen. I'm going to see my father one day. We're going to see all those who have gone on before that love Jesus. Because death is not the end for the Christian. It is only the beginning. Amen. He saved us from sin and death from Satan. Saves us from God's wrath and hell. Jesus saves us from God's wrath and hell is so true. To be a Christian is to be a guilty person saved from this wrath. God's holy justice against sin. And God's wrath in the Bible is expressed by some 20 different kinds of various words. It appears more than 600 times in the Old Testament alone. And it's also repeatedly mentioned throughout the New Testament. God's wrath is ultimately poured out on an unrepentant hell. You know what's so frightening to me about hell? The Bible says that they're tormented there day and night forever and ever in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. Have you ever considered that, that Jesus himself is overseeing this? That he himself is holy and righteous and pure and, and that every person that he has reached out to in this world, this life, right now during this time of living, that he reaches out with his arms of grace through that cross that he died upon for you and I, and he says, come to me, you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. And when we reject him, we push away that hope of eternity with him. Scripture says that they were all singing this thing. They had, seen, they had been singing uh, Hosanna, and the reason that the Bible says they were singing was because all of the miracles that they had seen. His ride into the city is just five days before Jesus is supposed to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem with his disciples. Just five days before they're going to string him out and rule him out and pull him up, put him on a cross. Pretty cool picture of Jesus being honored in this Palm Sunday and even more pointed that this same crowd worshiping him now saying Hosanna and laying their coats and palm branches before him on this road would later, the same crowd would cry crucify him. In just a short while, how can they cry Hosanna one minute and shout crucify the next? Because, friends, it is possible for someone to accept wisdom and then turn around and be mesmerized by sin. The question to them was the same question we face now. How much of this gospel will we hold on to? It's easy to worship in this nice warm room today with the music going and everyone entering in and maybe lifting their hands and, and giving God their best of worship. But what about when life hits us square in the face, when difficulties come? It's comfortable to worship with other Christians around and it's certainly easy for believers to serve the Lord in the company of fellow believers. But what happened when our faith is challenged or we're challenged by our faith? Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14, Scripture says, A backslider in his heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. There were some problems with him coming into the city. First of all, they were worshiping, they were praising him, and the Pharisees didn't like it. It says in Luke chapter 19, verse 39 and 40, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus replied, and he says, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. What an interesting statement. If they keep quiet, the rocks will cry out. In other words, the dirt of the earth is graced to have the king of all creation walk on it. His very presence demands worship. Every molecule and atom that assembles everything that we know and we, that we can see, he, he, he is, every rock knows his name, and, and even the colt that he knows is right. Have you ever tried to ride a new colt? This is an insane statement that we have in Scripture. When I was a kid living in Montana, we lived across the street from the rodeo grounds, and I've seen those guys break, trying to break those horses, and sometimes it's not a fun-looking thing. As a kid, I participated in a little rodeo, rode this little cow, but i got to tell you, when those big guys get on those big bulls and those, those you know, horses, like the, those broncos that they do, an untrained colt! That's what scripture says. You know, Jesus just gets on it and rides into the city. Another miracle. This is why we were created, friends. 
to give God the worship that he has created, that he has created us for. Many people go through life wondering why they're here, and, and friends, you and I are here to worship, and the power of it is that, that when we worship, the presence of God fills our life, and he gives us such purpose. And, and why do we worship? Because he's Savior, because he saves, and he saves us from our sin. He saves us from the threats to our soul. He saves you and I from the twisted philosophies and ideas of this world. He saves us from drinking from this world's toilet of philosophies and ideas. He saves us from these things. He is Savior. Hosanna. Jesus saves us to give us peace. Getting back to our story. In Luke chapter 19, verse 41, it says, As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known this day what would bring you peace, but now it was hidden from your eyes. He says, what would bring you peace? He's talking to Jerusalem. He's talking to the people. He's seeing them. People are looking for peace. Jesus addresses this by saying, if you only knew what would bring you peace, but it is hidden from your eyes. What was Jesus saying to them? He was trying to say, hey, I'm the one. Here I am. Look to me. You will know salvation. But he knew what was going to happen. That's what's so marvelous about his statements. He knows what's coming the whole time. And and this was God's chosen people. These were the ones he led into the promised land. And yet they rejected him time and time again. So here is this tremendous dichotomy. The heart of the city and the heart of God. The heart of God is longing to love and to heal. and, And the heart of the city is to hate and to destroy Friends, we are living in a life without Jesus and His grace and our sin, and we can't experience His peace if that's the case. And the heart of the city to, to hate is to hate and to destroy, and, and when we live without Jesus and His grace and our sin, we can't experience His peace. He sees our heart, and we, He sees our motivations. He knows what's going on. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 clarifies this as the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What a powerful statement that there is a blinding effect that sin does. He makes us blind. He puts blinders on our eyes so that we cannot see the grace of God. Though, though that we're so caught up in the way that we're going that, that there's really no hope for us or no one on our understanding this Savior. But he says he comes to bring you peace. He tells them, Jerusalem, if you only knew what would bring you peace, if you only knew what would bring you peace, and i got to think that Jesus is saying the same thing to us today. If you only knew what would bring you peace. As we look at our desk and the bills are piled up and the situation in life seems gloom and dark or that loved one that we relied on so much is gone and hopeless and and, and, and everything seems without hope and, and the whole time Jesus is saying, if you only knew What would bring you peace? He is calling for an entire generation. He's calling for us to reach out and to really touch him and to be in his presence. God's peace is unlike any other. In fact, it's prophesied about night way back in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, son is given, the government will be on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Chaos. The Prince of Trouble. It says the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. There's so many things in every life that we go through, and there's so many peace substitutes in our culture today. There's meditation. There's yoga. I won't do anything else. There's drugs. There's staying busy so we don't have to consider our miserable condition. Politicians promise peace. Religions off- offer peace. Buddhism says you can have peace if you cease all your natural desire. Confucianism says you can have peace through education, self-reflection, self-cultivation, and a moral life. Hinduism says you can have peace by detaching yourself from the separated ego and live a life in unity with the divine. Can't even wrap my mind around that. Islam says you can have peace by living a life of good deeds. Judaism says you gain peace through repentance, prayer, and working hard to obey the law. Ageism says you get peace by gaining a new perspective. Taoism says you can have peace by aligning yourself with the Tao to have peace and harmony in and all that is around you. 
What all religions and spiritualities, except for Christianity, hold in common is the theme that if there is peace, it comes from within you by your own power. There is no external God, or there is no external king, or there is no external prince of peace that will come and give you peace. There is no touch from the hand of God that supernaturally surpasses your ability to have peace. That's what all other religions say in the world. You must work for it to earn it. But the Bible says that when we come to Christ and we pour out our heart in repentance, that the Prince of Peace comes in and he gives us his peace. Paul talks about it in his epistle. Do not be anxious for anything, Philippians chapter 4, but in everything with prayer and petition, present your request to God. And the God and God will pass, the, the God of peace will pass all your understanding, will guard your heart and mind. Through Christ Jesus. That is a promise from an external God, a sovereign, all-powerful God that doesn't demand you to work toward Him, but He has come to you. He has come to me. He has come. He's the only God that comes to us. All others, we have to work to get to Him. Jesus says in John 14, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. Later in John 16, 33, two chapters later, I've told you these things that you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. In other words, a powerful overcoming factor that is in God is the same factor that is in us today. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in us. The same power that Jesus says when he's sitting there overlooking Jerusalem, if you'd only know what would bring you peace today. The same power that rose Jesus out of that grave, that, that he tore the, the, the bonds of hell, death, and the grave away, is living in us. God plans for every believer, all of us, to live a meaningful, peaceful, enduring life that has enduring peace. Not just a peace that comes and goes, not like, you know, don't worry, be happy. I don't know the rest of the song. That's all I know. Don't worry. Be happy. That's sort of a Jamaican feel. You know, can I, I can hear it, but I can't really sing it. So. But real peace. A peace that lasts. Not a peace that is just for the moment. Because I can have peace in a moment. I have peace in lots of moments. I have, I have peace sometimes if it's been a long day and I come home from work and I sit down in my chair or I, or I lay down for a while just to rest my eyes. That's peaceful. I like that. But I tell you what, I know why people get addicted to drugs. That stuff they give you before you go into surgery, when you go into surgery, man, when you come out, that's, that's like awesome. I mean, I'm sitting there going, oh my goodness, I never felt more relaxed. Should I be saying this? You never, I never felt more relaxed. I'm like, wow. You know what the nurse said? She said, Mr. Ellis, you have to breathe. And I'm thinking... I don't even want to breathe. I'm so rested. I'm just, I mean, can I have some of this for prayer time too? I'm crossing the line. We're crossing the line. There's a lot of things that people go after to bring us peace. God's peace is more than simple interruptions to chaos. Many believe that peace comes in moments that far and few between, that you know the, the ones when they're coming, and when everyone is standing around, actually, they every, all the shooting has stopped, and what's actually happened is everyone's just reloading. <laughs> God's peace is rather, is lasting, and is in the middle of the storm, it's peace that can have, we can have despite our circumstances, despite the chaos, despite our war, God, God's peace is the peace that you carry with you when your loved one dies. God's peace is the peace that never leaves when your money runs out. God's peace is there when you have failed. God's peace overcomes your guilt. God's peace is there when you suffer. God's peace is the calm of mind that is not ruffled by your adversity or overclouded by a remorseful conscience or disturbed by fear. It is God's peace that surpasses all of those things. Galatians 5, Paul writes, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. That a relationship with God via the Holy Spirit produces this peace. It is us opening up our hearts to God and saying, Would you pour into me, God, your peace? And along with that, He does a lot of other things too. He brings conviction to our sin, He brings 
healing to our brokenness. He brings restoration to the things that are torn down. He does all of these things because he is the prince of peace. You see, the God of peace is the one that was coming into the city that day, and they were shouting, Hosanna, oh, save us. He was, they were talking about a peace they were hoping for through a physical war. He was talking about a peace of your spirit, that in the middle of the storm, no matter what's going on in your life, that there is a calmness because you are listening to the voice of God rather than the voice of the world. And the voice of the world is loud. They're screaming at us every which way, up and sideways, down and backwards, every which way. It's in the music that we listen to. It's in the television. It's certainly in talk radio. It's everywhere that you turn. There's voices screaming, and there's no peace anywhere. It's just constant chaos and trouble and strife and issue and problems. When God says, my spirit produces peace, he was talking about something far greater than what they could have ever imagined. If you've ever been in the place as this man was, I don't know, his name is Horatio Spafford. I think I have a picture of him. There he is. Horatio Spafford was a godly man who loved his wife and children, his daughters. He loved them so much, he cared for them. He was coming to the United States and he put his family on the boat to go to get there. And on the way, there was a terrible storm. The ship went down and his wife and children died. In his terrible loss, he felt such heartache, such turmoil, such separation from reality in those moments. You know how it is. You've lost loved ones. But this was so impactful because his very children, whom he thought he would outlive, and, and, and that you, no parent should ever see their children die, was his thinking, I'm sure. That night, one night, he was on his way himself, finally made the, to make the journey to America, and he got on the boat, and as he was going on the boat, the same route that his family had taken, that they had perished in this terrible storm that had struck the ship and sunken, and where he lost everything that really that he cared about. But that night as he was going across the ocean, across the Atlantic, the, the ocean was peaceful. There wasn't as much of a crashing wave as far as the eye could see. It was like flat as glass. He went out, he asked the cabin, he, he asked the captain, he said, you when we get to such and such a place where my, the ship went down, they had my wife and children, would you ring my room? The captain did, sent a message, he came up on deck and he looked out on this glassy sea that was calm as could be. And in those moments, the inspiration came on him, I believe, by the Holy Spirit. And he sat down and he began to write, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Could you imagine writing that? In those moments? That in the middle of his heartache, in the middle of his storm, there was still peace. Amen. That's the only kind of peace I want. I don't need peace that comes from a peace pipe. I don't need peace that comes from those drugs they gave me in the hospital. I want the peace that passes all understanding, that guards my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Isaiah 26, verse 3. You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. So I want to ask you today, where is your trust? In whom do you put your confidence for peace? It's God's plan for his people to be examples of lives lived in true peace. We're saved to experience his peace. We are saved 
for peace. It's a wonderful testimony, but better yet, it is a wonderful thing to live. When everybody is around you and the world's falling apart or your world's falling apart and they look at you and they say, how can you have such peace? You can say, because I don't know whose report you're listening to, but the report I believe is that I'm on the Lord's side. And he and my faith in him, because of my faith in him, he gives me his peace. Can we stand and pray about this? Ask our worship team to come. We're going to sing this song, Amazing Love, together. Jesus, we are grateful for your Holy Spirit's words today. We are grateful, God, that you never leave us alone, that you care about us, that there is not one thing in this world that can separate us from your great love. And Lord, I know in this room this morning that there are those who may be suffering from a lack of peace. Turmoil has struck lives and maybe there's heartache or trouble. But Lord, in the middle of the trouble, in the middle of the storm, I know that you promised peace. So this morning, God, I want to ask you right now, would you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, Lord, as we engage you in worship, that as we respond to this word this morning in prayer, that you would meet the needs of those who are feeling turmoiled. You would meet the needs of those who are feeling rushed. You would feel and meet the needs, God, of every single person who is here that has not feel, felt peace in a long time, that you would bring calm to the storms of life. Because you are Savior, you are peace giver. Let's sing this together, shall we? I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted.